Next is regulation of cerebral blood flow. The main key factor regulating the cerebral blood flow is arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide. It has linear relationship with the cerebral blood flow. The more you increase the carbon dioxide, the more the vessel will dilate. So it can cause maximum vasodilatation. So if carbon dioxide is at peak, the vasodilation will be also at its peak. Now question, what if you go to gym and start exercising heavily, heavily, heavily and very heavily? What will happen to your cerebral blood flow? It won't change and this is the frequently asked question. Any degree of exercise won't change the regu won't change the cerebral blood flow unless and until proven otherwise if other factors are working. Now the cerebral blood flow also depends on perfusion pressure. If there is less perfusion pressure to the brain, that means it will do vasodilation so that more blood can go. Also, it depends on cerebral metabolism. Like say, if lactic acid goes to interstitium, it can do vasodilation, but not up to the extent of the vasodilation which is done by carbon dioxide. What is the effect of moderate exercise? Any sort of exercise? No change. Which of the following causes maximum cerebral vasodilation? Hypercarbia, that is increase in amount of carbon dioxide. Remember that had linear relationship. Cerebral blood flow is regulated by all except potassium ions, no role, arterial carbon dioxide, blood pressure, cerebral metabolic rate, potassium ion, no role. A 32 year old high altitude mountaineer is observed to have HCT of 70%. What's the reason? Now, look, as you go in the height, the oxygen there is reduced. Now the endothelial cells of the peritubular capillaries will sense less amount of oxygen and will release erythropoietin. This erythropoietin will induce erythropoiesis. This will increase the amount of RBC that means it will cause polycythemia and of course it increases red cell mass. Okay. All of the following statements about the bronchial circulation are true except did you even knew that lung had dual blood supply? One from pulmonary system and one from uh, bronchial circulation. From pulmonary circulation, the blood is going to lung to oxygenate the blood and to deliver the oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. Right? Now, even lung need oxygen. From where does the lung get oxygen? That's from the bronchial circulation. Right? Bronchial circulation supplies the fully oxygenated arterial blood to lung tissues themselves for their nutrition. Right? Bronchial circulation does not contribute to gaseous exchange. It's the pulmonary circulation which contributes to the gaseous exchange. Nitrogen narcosis. It's also called Kazan's disease or bends. Right? It happens in deep sea divers. When they go down, the pressure increases. And normally, when you increase the pressure, the solubility of gas increases. And normally nitrogen is not soluble. But when you go down, the solubility of nitrogen increases due to increase in pressure. And this will go inside the tissue and settle there. But when you come up, since the pressure is decreasing now, the solubility of nitrogen decreases, right? And it will come out and pop out as bubbles and it can block the arteries and it can cause severe pain. That's why it's also caused uh, it's called bends right so it's, it's mainly due to increase solubility of nitrogen in the nerve cell membrane pulmonary circulation differs from systemic circulation now here is the tendency for systemic circulation to dilate when there is hypoxia if a tissue piece in my hand is getting less amount of oxygen the vessels here will dilate to deliver more amount of oxygen this is in contrast to pulmonary circulation. If pulmonary circulation undergoes hypoxia, they'll have vasoconstriction. It is also called hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. Next, I want to discuss some of the important terms like partial pressure of oxygen. What's partial pressure of oxygen or arterial oxygen tension? Look, when you breathe in, you deliver oxygen to your blood vessel. And this uncombined form of oxygen exerts a pressure and that's called partial pressure of oxygen. Mind well that it's uncombined form of oxygen which exert pressure. It's called partial pressure of oxygen. Now when this oxygen combines with the RBC and the hemoglobin of RBC, 
this oxygen now no more exerts pressure okay so once the oxygen molecule chemically binds they no longer exert any pressure now if you have hypoventilation that means the net amount of oxygen which is coming is down now you'll have less amount of even uncombined oxygen that means you'll have low partial pressure and hypoventilation that's also due to increase in partial pressure of carbon dioxide carbon dioxide keeps on accumulating and at the top you don't have enough oxygen coming due to hypoventilation what happens in anemia anemia there is problem in rbc i mean the total no total amount of hemoglobin is decreased but do you think the total amount of oxygen which is coming from the lung is decreased no the, so the partial pressure of oxygen will remain same also the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin remains same the only thing that will change is total oxygen content that's due to decrease in amount of hemoglobin since the hemoglobin amount of de is decreasing you'll have less oxygen content i hope that's clear so in which of the following a reduction in arterial oxygen tension occurs it's in hypoventilation cause the amount of oxygen which is coming is less there's no problem in the uh, hemoglobin